Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the mistakes we made, all the things we left out, and why I might occasionally say a wrong word on this episode of Lies, because I'm coming back from paternity leave, and, uh, well, I'm on paternity leave, so I'm doing this 24 hours a day. Uh, we are 3 a.m. buddies, aren't we? Yeah. We, are, we have all our best conversations then. Mostly with you talking. So I'm going to go take him back to mom and I will be back to film the rest of the video. So I'm here to talk to you about the 30 Years War and all the mistakes we made and things we left out. Uh, first of all, I just want to say Lies is made possible by our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. I think Lies is a really integral part of the show. It's, it's really important that not only do we talk about mistakes when we make them, but also we just talk about, in general, the thought process that goes into making the show and why we took certain approaches. Um, history is a conversation and Lies allows us to do that. Um, let's jump in because there's a lot to talk about. We may not get a Ibn Battuta side trip uh, because there's so much. For recommended reading, The Thirty Years' War by C.V. Wedgwood. This is old. It was originally published in 1938. It was revised after World War II, um, but it's still considered really gold standard uh, narrative history version of these events. Uh, C.V. Wedgwood, by the way, just a little diversion, is a very, very cool person. Uh, she was not yet 30 when she wrote uh, this book. It was her first book, and she was a woman, you know, in a primarily male-dominated field at that point. So it's a really cool book in a lot of ways, and a big landmark in, in many senses. Uh, the Thirty Years' War, Europe's Tragedy by Peter H. Wilson, and also the alternate textbook edition, The Thirty Years' War, a source book, I really heavily relied on this book. Um, for example, if uh, the English diplomat, the story of him going into a plague village in episode four is, uh, it's essentially like a collection of primary source documents. Um, so you don't have to read, you know, 20 diaries to, uh, to understand what's the experiential nature of this conflict. Uh, BBC's In Our Time has a really great 30 Years War episode. It's a, a roundtable discussion with historians, and I, I love In Our Time because it gives you a back and forth with experts that shows you some of the current day controversies, controversies about how to treat and interpret uh, an event. It's a really good episode. Uh, also, a lot, a lot of articles. Uh, if you wanted to watch uh, something that goes into more religious aspects, we are sponsored by CuriosityStream, and we are part of the Nebula Network. CuriosityStream does have a... Uh, a series called the Hi a history of christianity and its fourth episode reformation the individual before god goes into some of the uh issues that we we talk about but it's a little more theological if you want to watch us on nebula and become a nebula member uh, which you can with a special discount code for us our episodes and some people we've collaborated with like legal eagle are on there uh, you can get a special episode on tipu sultan which is exclusive to nebula Let's talk about why we did the Thirty Years War this specific way. This is a series that is one of our most requested topics, both in the YouTube comments and among Patreon patrons. I had always been really wary of doing it for a few reasons. One is that it's just really, really complicated. The theological and religious aspects are complicated. The geographical aspects are complicated. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, a lot of the states that were big movers and shakers don't really exist anymore and are not familiar to a modern audience. Um, you, we can't throw up a flag of <laughs> some of these states and have you be like, oh, that's the lower Palatinate, you know. Um, so it's also really hard to do a series with a lot of famous characters because picking who's in and who's out always becomes kind of a fraught process. So I looked at many ways, like, I, I finally just was like, you know what, I'm just going to put it on the list, and if it gets voted through, I'm going to figure out how to do it. And it took me about a month and a half to figure out an approach that was going to work for five episodes without having to be like, this is our 30 Years War Part 1, where we just deal with the beginning of the war, or, you know, the Peace of Westphalia, or something like that. So with this format... We laid the groundwork. We had one episode on the beginning of the war, one episode on the end of the war. We talked about the experiential nature of the war and what it was like to be alive at that time and how it had such a high body count and why it was significant. 
And that way we can go back now and we can say like, okay, now we can do a series on Gustavus Adolphus or a series on uh, Wallenstein or any of those really interesting characters. So this is a topic we can go back to and that's one of the reasons I didn't go too heavily into the politics in the middle because I wanted to leave that to maybe do, uh, do one day. But I did try and create a through line of, of what's going on. So let's talk about another thing. <laughs> Maps and flags always are two most difficult things. Uh, we'll start off with a patron question from Hercules. When you talk about the Habsburg dynasty, you neglected to show all of their possessions from the Italian lands of Naples, Sicily, and Milan that were under the Spanish Empire, lands in France that were also under the Spanish. So maps and flags take a lot of time to get right. Flags change a lot, and they're not always helpful. It's not always helpful to use the right flag because it's not necessarily familiar to a modern audience. You don't necessarily look at a flag and say like, oh, that's Austria, right? If you're from Austria, you would absolutely recognize that, right? But particularly in a series where we're going to be doing name dropping so many states, big and small, I just made this decision where I was like, let's try and avoid using flags. And when we do use flags, we're going to mix in some modern flags and we'll just tag them as anachronistic often um, because there were just too many... There, were too, there was too much name dropping and too much information coming too fast to also throw a bunch of unfamiliar flags at people or flags that are older variants. Um, and so that's just a, a, a decision I made. So I, I'm sorry. I realized that it, Italy was not its own state. It was uh, a geographic region, but we used an Italian flag. It was just to try and make things comprehensible. I always try and say we try to be comprehensible rather than comprehensive. We're a short format show. Um, our scripts are only 1,500 words each or less. Uh, so we can't do everything, but we try and package things so that our format makes them as comprehensible as possible. Maps are really, really difficult in our format, partially because our animation style is simplified so that we can be a weekly show, right? That's why we have bean people without arms, right? Uh, because arms take a long time to draw. Maps are the most art intensive thing we do. Um, and there's a reason cartography is its own discipline, right? You can't just hand someone a map and be like, just copy this. Particularly with something like the Holy Roman Empire where there are so many squiggly lines. Basically our maps are good enough to illustrate the point we are trying to make at that point in the narrative uh, or the narration. And they have to be to a certain extent simplified. So I apologize that at, there are times that we left out the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but like some of these peripheral areas, it's just like we just need to focus on, you know, this specific area we're looking at. Otherwise, our artists will literally spend the entire time doing maps. Um, yeah, sorry, that's just, we're gonna, we're, and I knew taking on this, one of the other reasons I avoided it was I was like, we're gonna have so many map mistakes because it's inevitable with maps this complicated that are changing all the time. Um, particularly like if you look at, you know, a map of 1648 in Westphalia, it's just, it's so, so many lines. And there's like a key on the side and we just can't like, if we put that on the screen, it's actually not gonna help anyone very much. But also because things are drawn from scratch every time, things become amorphous uh, and you know, where things are located can kind of like slide around and, and look a little bit weird. Um, so, I apologize, we couldn't show some things. It's very difficult in our style to say like, this city is under this, you know. So uh, I knew we were gonna have map problems. That was basically a thing of like, all right, we're gonna do the 30s of war. Our maps are just gonna fall short sometimes, sorry. Patron question with ANA. How were the nations involved and able to fight for 30 long years despite so much bloodshed and destruction? The short version is they couldn't. As we mentioned in episode um, four and five, you have nations that are coming back in and dropping out, you know, multiple times over that period. There are periods of really intense fighting and there are periods where things kind of calm down a bit. Um, there are two phases. One phase lasts from 1618 to, six, excuse me, 1635. Includes Bohemian Revolt, the Platinate Campaign, Danish Intervention, Swedish Intervention. Phase two is 1635 to 1648 and, you know, involves France's entry into the war. It's a stop and go conflict that's actually semi-global right? Because if you watch our Jewish pirate series, stuff is going on in the Caribbean uh, and Brazil. So the Spanish are fighting Catalonia. 
uh, in revolts and things like that. So there are many, many facets of, uh, of, this, of this war that we didn't even get to. Patron question for Arjun Kapoor. Why were the Calvinists extremely heretical in Protestant and Catholic groups? Why was believing that Jesus was only in the bread and wine spiritually a big deal? Let me pull out my religion degree and try and make this as brief as possible. Calvinism is itself an umbrella group. Today, uh, generally, it's called Reformed because there are some groups that don't pull from John Calvin. But uh, in general, many uh, Christian groups like Catholics and Lutherans believe that the bread and wine is truly and substantially transformed into the body and blood of Christ during communion or the Eucharist. Uh, it looks the same, but in substance it has changed. Uh, Calvinists believe that there's a real presence of Christ, but it's spiritual, not substantial. Uh, basically, Jesus' body is in heaven and his spirit inhabits the bread and wine and is then taken in by the worshipers. If you want to see how this affects things in a very practical way, disposal is like one of the easiest ways to, to wrap your head around this kind of abstract issue for most of us. So if you're Lutheran or Catholic, disposal of unused Eucharist, it has to be consumed. So often if you go to like a Catholic Mass, at the end of communion you will see the priest drink the last of the wine. And that's because it can't be thrown out. Like that would be throwing out the blood of Christ or throwing out the body of Christ in the case of, uh, in the, in the, in the case of, uh, of wafer. But if you're Calvinist, you're like, well, the spirit has entered and it's left and it's fine. It's fine. It just, it's just bread. It's just bread and wine and you just toss it up. Um, but to Catholics, that is like, no, no, you are throwing out Jesus, literally throwing out Jesus. Um, there are only two sacraments in reform. There's baptism and Lord's Supper. Uh, infants can also be baptized. Um, early services often included no instruments. Even today in traditional reform services, there are more instruments than there were then, but they're kind of minimal. They're like piano, organ, harp, that kind of thing. Um, and if you go to a Reformed church today, like the one I grew up in, I grew up a uh, Congregationalist, which is a, a, a Calvinist group, um, you don't see images inside the church. Like there is a cross and there are maybe some architectural details on columns and things like that, but there aren't people. There are no statues. There are generally not paintings. You might you know, see an image of Jesus in a front plate of a Bible or a hymnal or something like that. But generally, the prohibition on images is quite strong or stronger than it is in Catholicism or Lutheranism. Um, there are other theological things like predestination, the idea some are predestined for heaven, justification by faith versus deeds, and ideas about free will, original sin versus total depravity. You get the idea. Episode one, patron question from Romulus Augustus. You said when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the church door, he sparked religious reformation that caused decades of war in Europe. What were the other wars and conflicts? There were often very small-scale civil wars. Um, there were repressions within, you know, France, some in Spain, not too many, but a lot in Germany, right? And, you know, you have one prince who's deciding that he's going to go, pro go Lutheran, and there will be fighting between him and uh, uh, neighboring Catholic states and things like that. These aren't, aren't huge wars. They're generally just grouped in, like, the wars of religion because it's these kind of small-scale conflicts, mostly pretty local. Patron question from TPA1981 and Gabriel Poole. If Frederick was a hardline Catholic who wanted to eradicate Protestants from the Holy Roman Empire, why would any Lutherans who were Protestant vote for Frederick? Joel Quinville asked a similar question. How was Ferdinand elected King of Bohemia if he was so strongly disliked? Did the electors change their mind? Did he lie about his religious policies? Basically, yes. These two can kind of be conflated into one thing. These are two separate events, but it's a little bit similar. Lutherans did not feel very under threat at the beginning uh, from Ferdinand because they were very established and had been for decades. They were part of governments. They did not feel like religious repression was probably going to be in their future. And they did not really want to associate with these more, as they saw them, radical Protestant groups like Calvinists and Anabaptists. They're like, they're making us look bad. Um, we are like the mainstream Protestants. Uh, and we want to, we're like doing pretty good, as we mentioned, like things were going okay uh, religiously. So they didn't really necessarily feel too much of a threat from Ferdinand. Um, so a lot of them voted for him. And they believed that their institutions in the Holy Roman Empire were strong enough that even if he was too Catholic in their feeling, that the institution would be strong enough. And it's like, listen, we just next time around, we'll elect someone else. 
Um, a lot of them also just didn't really care too much about what was going on in Bohemia. And they look at the Bohemian Revolt when they do the second defenestration of Prague and they're like, these guys are crazy. Like, we don't, we're not part of them. Yeah, sure, you become Holy Roman Emperor. This, we're, we're not associated with these guys. But then when it turns out that uh, Ferdinand is a little more, uh, little more Catholic than they had thought and a little more hardline than they thought, then they start to rethink. Um, but they were not interested in like breaking the empire in order to uh, keep Ferdinand away. Patron question, what was the first defenestration of Prague? So this involved a conflict I'm not going to get into called the Hussite Wars. Uh, there was a proto-Protestant uh, group uh, led by Jan Hus who was burned in 1415 in Prague's Old Town Square. You can actually see a, a, quite a nice statue of him in the Old Town Square today. Uh, and that Bohemia was primarily Hussite uh, before it was re-Catholicized um, in 1620, as we, as we mentioned. So basically, there was a fight between a Hussite group in 1618 and uh, the uh, town council over Hussite prisoners, and a mob stormed the town hall and threw eight guys out of a window and killed them. Uh, there was actually another defenestration that is not counted numerically because uh, the, the town leaders that were thrown out were already dead at that point. I guess it only counts if they die on impact. So basically, uh, this was already an established way of showing religious dissent to throw someone out of a window. We swapped Philip II and Philip III. Philip II died in 1598 before the, all the Bohemia, uh, before the Bohemian Revolt. But Philip II did help create the Catholic League. This is a problem caused by uh, the cross-contamination of my writing Jewish Pirates right before this, and my brain just getting switched around. So that's my fault. Sorry. Episode 2. Interesting thing about the Danish intervention. The Danish king was also a duke of the Holy Roman Empire, so Ferdinand's extended ambitions were a direct threat not to the Kingdom of Denmark, but to Christian IV's personal titles in the Holy Roman Empire. In fact, the council around him blocked him from intervening as the King of Denmark, and he used his personal title as Duke of Schleswig-Holstein and his personal funds to circumvent the council and intervene. Again, super complicated. That's why we didn't do the political history of this, mostly. Episode 3, patron question from Ison. Is there a specific Italian city-state that debased currencies came from? This is still disputed. Probably Milan. Milan handled a lot of the trade through Germany. Uh, from Italy to Germany. Germany was very much like a trade crossroads of Europe then as it is today. Um, but Milan handled a lot of the trade, so it might have come from Milan. YouTube questions. Uh, a bunch of people commented that if you take 800 gold coins and debase them to make 1,000 gold coins, your net worth went up 25%, not 20%. That is correct. It is a, like, sixth grade textbook like example of a uh, mistake in percentages. Um, and this is why I refuse to do our History of Mathematics series, because I'm terrible at it. Yeah. Hey, someone pointed out that the hardship of having to house soldiers, quartering soldiers in homes is very similar to the American Revolution. Yes, this also involved feeding the troops, which just made all the famine problems worse. Some debates about the term kipper from kipper and vipper. One commenter said it comes from the word kippen, which means to dump or pour, not clipping coins, but like pouring them into other economies and, and, and markets. My understanding is it can also mean melting uh, clipped bits of coins and creating new coins. It's These are things that are never going to be solved, partially because there was language variation within the Holy Roman Empire. And probably discussing different origins deepens our understanding of it rather than one being right and one being wrong. Vipper might refer to a specific type of weighing uh, as like they would kind of do a sleight of hand thing so that the scales never actually went level. Um, when they were when they were trading currencies, and uh, it also probably referred to the the market fluctuations of the value of currency. Uh, it probably means both. Um, remember, they're both literal and figurative meanings of sayings. Episode four: We introduce Christian the fourth when we talk about the Dutch leaving the Thirty Years' War, but he was Danish, entirely different country. Uh, uh. This is a common linguistic mistake in English. For whatever reason, English speakers have a really difficult time and frequently switch around Dutch versus Danish. Um, and I did it, and I'm sorry. I know it's very annoying to people who are from uh, the Netherlands and Denmark. My apologies. It is just me doing a lot, and I'm sorry. <laughs> like, um, and also, I spent like six weeks reading about the Netherlands while doing Jewish pirates, so I had Netherlands on the brain. 
Episode five, patron question from Joel Quinville. The Easter egg in the final episode, uh, which references the nearly complete and utter history of everything brought me so much joy. I really love Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. I didn't realize that was a full show, uh, but you should go watch the piece of Westphalia sketch. Uh, I think it's called The Treaty of Westphalia um, on YouTube. I saw it there. I didn't know there was the rest of a show. I'm going to go watch it now, you know, in between like feeding uh, my baby at two in the morning. This one's going to really bother me. We switched around Munster and Osnabrück. Munster is the Catholic one. Osnabrück is the nominally Protestant one. Actually, it was split, which is what caused me the problem because um, it was uh, the government was Lutheran in Osnabrück, but it still had a, um, a, a, a Catholic prince bishop and a large Catholic population. Actually, had two Lutheran churches and two Catholic churches, um, but it was like nominally Protestant. Um, and in, I had it right originally, but when I went in and used track changes and edited everything to try and convey that more, then I ended up deleting a bunch of stuff because it was over word count. Like I ended up creating the error. So I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Matt Troubles get us again. We misspelled Brandenburg. We did the B-E-R-G, which is the more common American version of Berg. Um, and we highlighted wrong areas of the Palatinate. Uh, I, again, I knew Matt Troubles would get us. I'm really sorry. Coming up on Extra History, we have Vlad the Impaler, which has a cool horror vibe. Rasputin, which I am really looking forward to. I got to play in all the early 20th century occult weird stuff, which my religion major heart just absolutely loves talking about. Uh, we have a two episode on the Great Emu War that is being written by uh, Duncan Fife, a guest writer who did one of my favorite uh, ever history podcasts, which is uh, Something True, which is hilarious and you should go listen to. Um, and then uh, we're going to do a vote on one that is uh, actually past our usual uh, 1920s cutoff right now. So we have stuff on the Czech resistance, the American mafia, Japanese militarism, and the Spanish Civil War. Our patrons are going to be voting on these. Uh, I think the vote will probably be concluded by the time this comes out, though. Um, as always, keep an eye out. We may be dropping a sponsored episode here or there. Uh, or something else fun. Uh, I should probably mention that I'm not in my office because there's a baby in my office. This is uh, this is the office of our cameraman, Mike. Thank you, Mike, so much. Uh, so let's just do a real quick Ibn Battuta side trip. Uh, I want to talk about the Thirty Years' War and memory. Uh, memory is an aspect of historiography that has gotten a, a lot more uh, attention recently. So when, when we look at how the past is remembered at certain different times, uh, we sort of hinted at the fact that a lot of particularly German troops in World War I looked at what was going on and said, like, this is another 30 years war. And what's funny is that often you will even see... Um, so, like, in the 1960s, they did uh, public opinion polls in, in West Germany of, like, what was the hardest time in German history? Keep in mind... This is after World War I and World War II, and the top vote was the Thirty Years' War. So there's a really strong cultural memory uh, in Central Europe of the Thirty Years' War, and there have been uh, a lot of Central European films about this period. Um, there was a, a 1925 silent film about Wall uh, Wallenstein, uh, a 1964 Czech-Black comedy called A Jester's Tale, um, but there are also kind of weird ways it still echoes, like, uh, if you're at all into Warhammer, right? The Empire from the Old World has a lot of uh, uh, Thirty Years' War vibes to it. Um, so it's a... But even if you go to Germany, like, you'll be sometimes, like, taken on a tour and you'll see ruins and you'll be like, oh, that's World War II or World... you know. And they'll be like, no, no, this is Thirty Years' War. And it's still a very present memory right? Even 400 years later for some of it at this point. Um, in Prague as well, uh, you see there are, if you go to Old Town Prague, there are crosses marking the spot where the executions we talked about in episode one happened. So it is a very present memory in Central Europe in a way that it is not so much, you know, in, in the rest of the world. So it's locally, it is very, very heavily remembered. Um, and kind of our objective in the show is to say why. Like, why is this 400-year-old war still feel very close and very present today? And I, I think we've shown, like, what a psychic shock this was um, for the whole of Europe. But thank you for tuning in. I really look forward to seeing you at with uh, Vlad the Impaler. And hopefully I'll, I'll be less tired then. 
Probably not. Hopefully. Probably not. Bye. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Zia Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons. 